this chair for a thousand years and watch the woods consume the neighborhood watch the ambitions come and go surround me and engulf me we could ditch the tv and spend a little more time reading books and singing songs on the porch sit here watching the daylight wane leaving little trays and even less memory i just want to be still hi my name is lee nish pastor at sparks united methodist church welcome to worship and we are in the midst of a series of messages entitled Left Behind the Lost. And during the season of Lent, we're focusing on what sometimes we leave behind, and also particularly Jesus's text, which comes from Luke chapter 19, verse 10, which, in which he states his mission, which is the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. So that of all the things that we might consider leaving behind us for Lent, it had better not be the lost. And one of the things that we find out from the story we're going to hear today is that sometimes the voices of the lost are either muffled or silenced. And so we find that unless we pay special attention, unless we look around, we may very easily leave the lost behind. Welcome to worship. Let me be your servant, let me walk your way. Guide me on your path, keep like the light of day. Let me be a sure foundation, pure and strong. Let me tell them your salvation all life long. Give me ears to listen, give me eyes to see, give me words to speak and show your face to me. I'm Mona Sargent, and today I'm reading from Luke 18, where Jesus heals a blind beggar near Jericho. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, praised God. So I have to admit, I am not the most observant guy in the world. In fact, it was uh, shortly after our first child, Andrew, came along and uh, we were trying to get Andrew to sleep in his own room and Joe and I were trying to sleep in our room and inevitably, sometime during the night, Andrew would start to cry. Well, my wife Joanne would wake up, get out of bed, go and comfort Andrew. Well, this happened time and time again and finally, you know, because I was just sleeping through the entire drama, finally Joanne got a little frustrated and one night when Andrew was crying, she woke up, looked at me, took her pillow and started smashing me over the head saying, no, you wake up, you go and take care of him. <laughs> well, uh, that's pretty much a metaphor for how easy it is for me to kind of be aloof and not actually look around to the point where I'm seeing the people and the opportunities that God is putting in front of me to be able to stop and be compassionate and do the real work of Jesus, offering compassion to people. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. Um, how much do we look around? How much do we attend to the opportunities that come before us? Now you've already heard the text read about a blind beggar near Jericho. And I want to just share with you the first opening lines because we learn a lot about the situation in these first lines. I'm reading, of course, from Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Now then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Well, those, were, those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. Wait a minute. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. Hmm. Where have I heard that before? Well, it was only two weeks ago and going up a few paragraphs, and I remember it's when Jesus blessed the little children. Again, still from chapter 18, but those opening verses, listen to verse 15, and, uh, and then Jesus' response in 16. People were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when his disciples saw it, aha, uh -huh, here it comes. They sternly ordered them not to do it. In this, the disciples sternly ordered them not to do it. In the story today, those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. Do you ever notice that sometimes the people who are most in need are robbed of their voices? It's almost as if we want to be too efficient in how we conduct our lives so that we don't want to bother to look around and maybe see whether it's small children who oftentimes can't speak for themselves or a blind beggar whose voice can be very easily muffled in the in the crowd, sometimes we don't see them because others have more interest in what our business or task is at hand, not the interruptions. I'm like anybody else. 
I get frustrated with interruptions. But I know that interruptions usually offer opportunities for me to be in greatest ministry. I'll tell you that over the 40 some years that I've been in ministry, when the phone rings and I find somebody's in a hospital and the issue is serious, I drop everything, whatever it is. I get in my car, I drive to the hospital. Not always life and death, but many times I think back and think, oh, I am glad that I went to the hospital because otherwise I would have missed an opportunity to pray for that person before they transitioned from this life into the next. It is those, uh, it, it is those interruptions that oftentimes become the very opportunity for us to share compassion. And there's something else about this text that I want to just lift up, the text of the blind beggar. You know, it's almost a phrase that belongs together with two words, blind and beggar. Why is this person a beggar? Well, this person is a beggar because he's blind. And there aren't others who are expressing compassion around him to lift him up, to care for him, to care for his needs. So he somehow has to struggle himself to be able to express himself. You know, some churches, maybe even some pastors, find it very easy to be about efficiency. They want to not bother with the interruptions. They want to just go about the business of teaching scripture. And you know, this is what I really appreciate about the Gospel of Luke. Do you realize that in the Gospel of Luke there are 14 healing stories that go into depth about Jesus' uh, tendency to stop and to ask, what is it that I can do for you? 14 healing stories. Now in, in the Gospel of Mark, only 16 chapters, it's just the facts, ma'am. In the Gospel of Matthew, that's the teaching gospel. It's all about what Jesus is teaching. Ah, but the Gospel of Luke. You know, it's understood that Luke was a physician. And so when Luke looked around, what was he looking for? He was looking for someone, a savior, who would heal. Do you realize that's what a lot of people are looking for today? They're looking for churches who are willing to engage with people whose voices might otherwise be neglected, to hear them, to ask, what is it that we can do for you, and to heal. So those are the churches that are doing the work of compassion in the name of Jesus. Those are the pastors who are doing that very work. I'm so proud as when I look around this church and I see, I see people in this congregation who are looking around, attending to folks whose voices might otherwise be neglected. It was just two weeks ago that we received a call from the principal of uh, Robert Mitchell High School or elementary school. One of the children had been airlifted to Stanford and the family was left distraught, a family of very little means. Now they weren't beggars, but they didn't have anyone to surround them with help. Well, the principal called us because she knew that our church cared very much for people who were in need and wanted to hear their voice. We were able to help because our director of human needs was able to actually gather the cash on Friday morning, just take it herself to make sure that the family had cash they needed to support them to be able to go to Stanford and spend time with their child. I'm amazed every time I show up here on a Tuesday, you know, we just, a few years ago, we had a little cabinet with a few cans of food in it. And when somebody would come by the church, our office manager would just pull out a few cans of food, put it in a bag, give it to them and send them on their way. Do you realize that now every Tuesday, we have anywhere from 60 to 80 persons coming that represents uh, oftentimes 150 to 200 families who are receiving food. Because for many of them, there is no other option. Now, are they out there begging? No. 
but they don't have the money to both pay the rent and to put food on the tables and to care for their children. Perhaps this amazed me the most. You know, it's very easy to not respond to people who are ill, whose names and faces we never see, whose voices we never hear. But less than two years ago, we partnered with a group called RIP Medical, and we were able to eliminate all the medical debt that was going into collections of people all across the state of Nevada, say for just a, a few urban areas of Los Angeles, or of Las Vegas. And now we are in the midst of another drive, this time with several other churches, to raise $18,000, which will eliminate $1.8 million of medical debt that would otherwise go into collections and ruin the lives of families who, because of no fault of their own, could not possibly shoulder that debt. And this time, it will include all the counties of Nevada, including Clark, Clark County, Los Angeles, or Las Vegas area, and sometimes, some perhaps even parts of Northern California. This is who we are. We are the very people who are looking around and seeking out the lost who otherwise would be left behind and stopping in the midst of our daily lives, greeting them, looking them in the face and saying, what is it that I can do for you? Let me finish this text so you have the full picture of how Jesus responds. Those who were in front ordered him to be quiet but the beggar shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people when they saw it, praised God. We don't want people to praise God because of the attack, attraction of our worship services and the bar of excellence we meet or try to meet all the time in what we do, both in person and online worship. What we pray for is that people will praise God for how God works through the heart of the people of this church and the people of many churches in acts of compassion as we witness to Jesus Christ. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord?
my name is Cindy Evans, and I am so glad that you're here today. I'm one of the worship leaders here at Sparks United Methodist Church, but I'm also one of the prayer leaders, and I've been praying for you. No matter where you are in this space and time, we're so glad that you're here. Will you pray with me? God of love and grace, we thank you for this opportunity to pause, to listen to your word and to your message and Pastor Lee's teachings as he's been inspired by you. Help us to remember that you came to save the lost. And then to remember also that we are always growing in your love. We won't be perfect each time, but that we should reach out and try again. Lord, we give to you all that's on our hearts right now from those quiet, peaceful places where we know calm, all the way to those chaotic places where we might be unsure or looking for courage. Lord, hear our prayers. And hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. May its meaning bring new light to our lives today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May God be with you in the coming week and may his grace and courage and strength give you the strength to share his love with others. Go in peace. Hey, thanks for joining us for worship today. And uh, if you happen to be one of those folks who are sorely in need of healing, and are at risk of being left behind, contact us, send a connect card, let us know how we can pray for you, or better yet, how we can reach out to you and serve you in the name of Jesus with compassion. And also, if you're seeing this and understanding maybe God is calling upon you to be part of a force of compassion in this world, well, I can only encourage you in this way. Every act of compassion brings in an opportunity to live into the kingdom of God as Jesus had desired. Join us. Walk through our doors or connect with us. We want to put you to work in reaching out and seeking and saving the lost, even in the course of healing. And as you do that, you not only change a life and your life, you'll change the world. Go change the world. Thanks for joining us here at Sparks UMC. You can connect and join the conversation on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. To receive the weekly emails that share what's happening in the Sparks UMC community, scan the QR code on the screen, or let us know by filling out the connect card on our website. If you would like prayer, email us at sparksumcprayers at gmail.com or scan the code. We are grateful for your support of the ministry and mission of Sparks UMC. We'll see you next time. Be blessed.